Liu Shi, the son of Swan Di, is known to history as Xiao Yuan Huang Di, filial and prime August Emperor, Yuan Di for short. He is often considered a milk toast character, and his reign was devoid of major dramatic events that had dynasty lasting ramifications. Nevertheless, there were several interesting occurrences, which are worth talking about, both for their own sake and for what they indicated about the direction of the dynasty. From an illegal campaign against the Xiongnu to radical and far-fetched economic proposals, most of these stories suggest that the reformist position which we've talked about for the past few episodes had well and truly become the mainstream political attitude, and that Confucianism was now on an unstoppable rise. Symbolically, in 44 BC, Ji Yan Yan, the descendant of the old Zhou royal house, was ennobled as Marquis who succeeds to the greatness of the Zhou dynasty, the dynasty that was taken as exemplary by the reformists. Yuan Di's greatest claim to fame is that he was probably the first Han emperor who was fully committed to Confucianism. In his early years, he had been tutored by two Confucian scholars, Xiao Wang Ji and Zhou Can, and when Xuan Di had been making his final arrangements before dying, he had asked these two men to help guide Liu Shi in his rule as emperor. Xiao and Zhou keenly persuaded the new emperor to promote Confucianism, and Yuan Di was happy to comply. He selected Confucian scholars to serve in the highest positions of government. His first chancellor, Yu Dingguo, had studied the spring and autumn annals. Yu had been appointed by Xuan Di, but Yuan Di allowed him to remain in the post for several years. Then, when he was replaced in 42 BC, the new chancellor was another classicist, Wei Xuan Cheng, an expert in the Book of Odes. Yuan Di's third and final chancellor, Quang Heng, was also an expert in the Odes. Several of his imperial counsellors, such as Gong Yu, Sui Guang De, and Zheng Hong, were also classical scholars. Aside from his choice of ministers, Yuan Di's edicts also exhibit his love of Confucian learning, being full of classical quotations and constantly making references to Confucian philosophical ideas. However, Yuan Di's love of Confucianism may have been of little consequence in the broader political and intellectual history of the Han. Most historians portray him as a reserved individual, who had little impact on governance. Michael Lowe says, quote, There is no reason to believe that he exercised marked influence on any decision of state. René Grousset describes him as, quote, A timid and irresolute intellectual, a scathing remark that nonetheless endears you one day to the author of this podcast as perhaps the most relatable of the emperors we've discussed so far. Even the prominence of Confucian officials during his reign may not really have been a result of his own efforts. Historian Liang Tsai shows how most of the eminent scholar officials of Yuan Di's reign had already reached important positions during Xuan Di's reign, or else used their own contacts with, cl- with other classicists already in government to get recommended. Thus, she says, quote, Although the ratio of eminent Ru Confucian, officials to non-Ru officials was higher under Emperor Yuan than any other time in Western Han history, this cannot be attributed simply to Yuan's love of Ru learning. Yuan Di's general lack of governmental skill led to a situation that, while iconic in broader Chinese history, was something of an anomaly in Western Han. The emperor's eunuchs rising to power and coming into conflict with the bureaucracy or literati. We've encountered some important eunuchs, such as Li Yan Yan, the brother of Wu Di's Lady Li, Su Guang Han, father of Xuan Di's Empress Su, and of course, Sima Qian. But the sort of control wielded by someone like Zhao Gao during the Qin is largely absent from the history of Western Han. Nevertheless, there was one instance in Yuan Di's reign, and although I wouldn't consider it a major event or turning point in the history of the dynasty, it's still pretty interesting. The eunuchs, where they did gain influence, did so through their position as palace writers. These were the private secretaries of the emperor. There seems to be some confusion, well, at least I'm a bit confused, over whether or not they were connected to the secretariat, the institution Huo Guang had controlled and utilised in his government. The important distinction, though, is that while the secretariat was responsible for delivering proposals to the emperor, its regular members could not attend on an emperor in his private chambers, entrance to which was restricted to the emperor's women and his eunuchs. Thus, if a particular emperor was prone to conducting business from his chambers, the eunuch palace riders could become very powerful in their capacity as a communication line between the emperor and the rest of the government. The conflict actually started out between a handful of non-eunuchs. 
On one side, there was the Confucian scholars Xia Wangji and Zhao Kan, who had served respectively as Yuande's senior and junior tutors while he was heir apparent, and who were concurrently appointed director of the secretariat upon his enthronement. And on the other side, there was Shi Gao, a maternal relative of Yuande, whom Suande had appointed Marshal of State shortly before his death. Shi Gao was the son of Shi Gong, who had been the brother-in-law of Liu Zhu, Wu Di's heir apparent who died in the witch trials, and Yuande's great-grandfather. Suande had hoped that these three men, Xia Wangji, Zhao Kan, and Shi Gao, would guide Yuande in his government. However, Shi Gao and Xia Wangji were not on friendly terms, and were soon competing with each other. Xia Wangji was the most celebrated Confucian scholar of his age, and the men in his clique, like Zhao Kan and Liu Xiang, superintendent of the imperial clan and a student of the Guliang Commentary of the Spring of All Manals, were both respected classicists in their own right. All three had attended the seminal discussions on the classics at the pavilion of the Stone Canal. To compete with men of such gravitas, Shi Gao butted up some other Confucian scholars, such as Quang Heng, an expert in the Book of Odes. However, the most important men he recruited to his side were two palace riders, Hong Gong and Shi Xian. Shi Xian and Shi Gong were not relatives. Hong Gong and Shi Xian had both ended up as eunuchs after running afoul of the law in their youth. Having worked in the palace for some time, they had become very capable in the skill of the government. They knew the law well, could write memorials, and were good at citing historical precedents. Yuande, who did not possess such capabilities and was often confined to his chambers by illness, came to entrust them, Shi Xian especially, with nearly every decision of government. The focus of Xiao Wangji's enmity turned from Shi Gao to Shi Xian. Xiao told Yuande that using eunuchs in such an important role was inappropriate and not in accordance with ancient practice. Quote, The office of Imperial Secretary, Secretariat, is the root of all offices and the axle of the state. The emperor should employ enlightened and fair-minded men to this office. Emperor Wu often amused himself and held banquets in the consort's palace. This is why he employed eunuchs as imperial secretaries. But this is not how the traditional institution worked. The position of eunuch of the secretariat, palace rider, should be abolished so as to accord with the ancient convention and to avoid associating with men who have been subjected to corporal punishment. But Yuande was deaf to Xiao's objections. Shi Xian and his followers accused Xiao's clique of forming a nepotistic cabal, slandering eminent officials and members of the imperial family, and plotting to seize power. Yuande allowed Shi Xian to deal with the problem. However, it's doubtful that he really understood what he was approving. When Shi Xian requested Yuande to, quote, ask the imperial messenger to summon them to the office of the commandant of justice, superintendent of trials, Yuandi did not realise that this was a technical term, asking for the arrest of Xiao's clique. As it turned out, Zhao Kan and Liu Xiang, two most prominent members of Xiao's clique, were imprisoned, while Xiao was merely dismissed from office. This occurred in the spring of 47 BC. In the summer, Yuandi forgave the three of them. Zhao Kan and Liu Xiang were released, and Xiao was granted the 19th rank. Yuandi was intending to make Xiao Chancellor, the sudden clemency they received was due to an earthquake and some foreboding astronomical occurrences, which were believed to be a result of the way that Xiao and his friends had been treated. In the winter, though, after Xiao and the others had been brought back, another earthquake happened. Liu Sang memorialised to the emperor that this was a warning that the eunuch's power was inappropriate. In turn, Shi Xian told Yuan Di that Xiao Wangji was too prideful, and ought to be charged with some minor crime and imprisoned for a short time in order to humble him. Yuandi was hesitant, but eventually agreed. Shi Xian quickly sent for the police to surround Xiao's house. To be arrested was considered a disgrace for such a respected man as Xiao Wangji, and when he heard that the police were outside, he considered committing suicide. His wife begged him not to, reassuring him that Yuandi did not want him dead. However, one of Xiao's disciples told him that it was the only honourable option left. Accordingly, Xiao drank poison and died. When Yuan Di heard, he was distraught and wanted to punish Shi Xian. But she and the others apologised and claimed that they had not expected Xiao to do what he did. 
Eventually, the issue was left to rest, and she had disposed of his most vocal opponent. Several years later, Hong Gong died, and Shi Xian became the chief palace rider. Because of this role, and the task that Yuan Di divulged to him, he was the most powerful man in government. Some Confucian scholars, blaming Shi for the death of Xiao Wang Ji, attacked him, saying that natural disasters and bad omens were the result of his inordinate influence. In response, Shi cultivated some Confucian scholar friends of his own, such as Gong Yu, who became imperial counsellor, and Wu Lu Chong Zong, an expert in the Book of Changes, in order to better his own reputation. He also ruthlessly persecuted his critics. When one of the brothers of Yuan Di's lady Feng, Feng Chun, started badmouthing him, she had him sacked, and later ensured that another of her brothers, Feng Ye Wan, did not become imperial counsellor. Another victim was Jing Fang, an expert in the Book of Changes. When Jing started linking Shi Xian's improprieties with various natural disasters, she had him appointed to a governorship far away from the capital, and later, in 37, had him executed for divulging imperial secrets. When Yuan Di started looking a little worse for wear, Shi prudently resigned his post as palace rider, fearing that he would suffer punishment after the emperor's death. He took up a lowly position attending members of the harem. However, he did not escape reprisal. Shortly after Yuan Di's death, the Chancellor, Quang Heng, and the Imperial Counselor, Zhang Tan, brought the issue of Shi Xian to Emperor Cheng's attention. Although Quang Heng had got his start through Shi Xian's ally, Shi Gao, he was deeply opposed to eunuchs wielding undue power. Shi Xian was dismissed from the palace and sent home. Terribly worried about what would happen to him, he lost his appetite, fell sick, and died. A few years later, in 29, the use of palace riders was officially ended. Thus, no other eunuchs achieved the same level of importance for the remainder of Western Han. As for Shi Gao, the guy who was first involved in the conflict with Xiao Wang Ji, I'm afraid I've been unable to find out what became of him in the ensuing food. However, since his son, Shi Dan, was a key player under later emperors, I'd assume he didn't come to too much grief. Yuan Li's reign was notable for increasingly radical reformist economic policies, both policies that were merely suggested and ones that were actually implemented. The idea was to curtail expenditure and to reduce taxes, in the name of lightening the people's burden. Many of these proposals came from a Confucian scholar named Gong Yu, whom I briefly mentioned as a friend of Shi Xian's. He was an expert on the Gongyang commentary on the spring and autumn annals, and had previously served as one of the academicians of the Imperial University. Under Swande, he worked in some minor administrative roles, including as a regional inspector and as a magistrate, but illness forced him to retire from these positions a number of times. Under Yuande, he became an advisory counsellor, and started inundating the emperor with various policy suggestions. Thanks to his friendship with Shi Xian, Yuandi was happy to lend him an ear, and eventually, in 44 BC, Gong Yu became imperial counsellor. Despite being in his 80s by then, he managed to undertake some of the most radical economic projects since the days of Wu Di. However, less than a year after his appointment, he died in office. In his time as advisory counsellor, Gong Yu often remonstrated Yuan Di for the massive amounts of money that were spent by the imperial court on luxuries. He blamed Wu Di for increasing the extravagance of the court. 50 million cash was spent on making gold and silver vessels for the court, he said, and hundreds of millions making silk clothes and garments. While imperial horses were kept well fed and fat, common people were starving and even resorting to cannibalism. Some of the unnecessary expenditure was, in fact, cut down. Beginning in 48 BC, certain imperial stables, banquets, palace guard units, and other luxuries came to be either reduced or abolished. In 44 BC, once Gong Yu became imperial counsellor, he was able to bring about more radical reforms. They were guided by the same sort of philosophy that had been held by the literati of the Sultan Iron Conference in the reign of Zhao Di. Hunger and impoverishment were the result of people pursuing occupations other than agriculture. The age at which a child became subject to the poll tax on children was raised from three years to seven. Gong claimed that many families practiced infanticide to avoid paying this tax. 
It's also notable that most of the money raised from the poll tax on children went to the lesser treasury rather than the Ministry of Agriculture, and hence was used on court rather than palace expenses. In some cases, ideology got in the way of practicality. Gong managed to get the Sol's Nye monopolies that had been set up in Wudi's reign abolished. However, the enormous loss of the revenue that this entailed forced the government to re-establish them shortly afterwards, in 41 BC. Another achievement was the abolition of some storage granaries that had been built in 54 BC, in service of the price stabilisation system created by Wu Di. These granaries helped to save costs in transporting grain, and the system itself benefited both consumers and farmers by ensuring a stable demand and supply for grain. But because the reformists were ideologically opposed to the system, these particular granaries were done away with. One of Gong Yu's most radical proposals, which was not attempted at all, was to return to a pre-monetary economy. The simple rustic economy of ancient times was highly admired. Gong believed that the presence of cash led to people abandoning agriculture. Farmers were enticed by the enormous wealth that some merchants were able to make by speculative buying and trading, which was only possible because of the use of currency. On the other hand, having to pay taxes in cash forced farmers to do other work where, where they could earn some coin if they did not make enough selling their produce. Gong proposed that only land should be taxed, that taxes in government salaries be paid in grain or silk rather than cash, that merchants be essentially criminalised, and that the government should shut down its minting and copper mining operations. Of course, this was too much for anyone else in government to stomach. Aside from the difficulty of implanting any of these ideas, it would have been very inconvenient for the highly paid officials to dispose of their income had it consisted of grain and silk rather than money. On the surface, it seems like a completely impractical proposal, and in some ways it certainly was. We'd usually assume that once an economy has developed to the level of using currency, it had been possible to go back, even if there was a desire to. However, we should keep in mind that at certain points in history, even if cash never disappeared completely, there were times when its circulation dwindled and people largely returned to trading goods for goods. One needs only think of medieval Europe after the Roman Empire. Decreasing monetization is even a feature of our own topic. After periods of severe disorder, such as the transition from Qin to Han, or, as we'll see, the transition from Western Han to Eastern Han, trade in coins had to be supplemented with trade in goods like grain and silk. One case where Gong Yu actually wanted to increase spending testifies his ideological motivations. Previously, there had been a quota on the number of students who could be sent to the Imperial University to study under the officially appointed Confucian academicians. Gong Yu removed these quotas so that more students could attend, hoping to fill out the bureaucracy with more classicists. However, like the Sultan I monopolies, this decision was reversed in 41, and the quotas were reimposed. Bangu in the Book of Han explains, quote, The government income was insufficient. Presumably, the state financed the disciples while they studied, and the increased number of students was costing too much. Also, since there was a limited number of academicians, there must have been a practical limitation on how many students the university could take at one time. There's also another official whom I'd like to mention in regards to this topic, named Xiao Xin Chen. Like Gong, Xiao was a Confucian scholar. He made a name for himself as governor of Nanyang Commandery, where he worked diligently to increase agricultural productivity. He inspected and improved many of the irrigation works, and personally ploughed the fields in order to inspire industriousness among the peasantry. He was also celebrated for fairly deciding disputes over the use of water, demarcating property boundaries with the use of border stones, and prosecuting lazy subordinates. In 33, the final year of Yuande's reign, he was made superintendent of the Lesser Treasury, granting him responsibility over state finances. Like Gong Yu had done, he recommended cuts to various court luxuries, including a technique for growing certain plants out of season by artificially heating them, a system that I'm sure provided tasty produce for the emperor's table, but consumed a lot of fuel. Another cut that Xiao Xin Chen recommended was the abolition of the Office of Music, which had been established by Wu Di. In fact, the funding of this bureau had been slowly reduced since the reign of Xuande. 
the number of musicians, performers, and other personnel it employed had been lessened in 70 BC and 48 BC. Perhaps as a result of Shao's objections, in 33, the Office of Music discontinued some of its more extravagant practices, such as female choir performances at state rituals. In general, the objection to the Office of Music came both from financial and ideological concerns. Financially, it was, of, it was another unnecessary luxury that the court spent an enormous amount of money on. And ideologically, the Office of Music, as we discussed in the episode of Wu Di, sometimes preserved or created songs that were not in line with the Confucian orthodoxy. They often dwelt on mortality and physical pleasures, which were not considered appropriate themes, and it was thought that they might provoke lewdness. In 7 BC, under Emperor Ai, the Office of Music was finally abolished. However, its legacy continued to inspire Chinese poetry for some time afterwards. One of the interesting cutbacks that was made, or at least attempted, concerned the temples to previous emperors and their relatives. As the dynasty had matured and emperors passed, the number of ancestral shrines grew and grew. Gaozu had built shrines for his father, the Grand Supreme Emperor, in the capital and every kingdom. For Gaozu himself, there was a place of worship in every commandery, and there were shrines to Wendy and Wudi in the commanderies they had travelled through in their reigns. In the capital, there were temples for every emperor, as well as for various other relatives, like empress dowagers and brothers. By Yuande's reign, there were 167 shrines in the provinces, and 176 in the capital region. 24,455 meals were offered in worship every year, and 67,276 people were employed as guards, priests, cooks, musicians, and in other roles in service of these shrines. If some of these temples could be disbanded, it'd save a fair few pennies. By the way, the organ of government that was responsible for the upkeep for these tombs was the Ministry of Agriculture, rather than the Lesser Treasury. The suggestion to disband some of the tombs was first made by Gong Yu, but his death in 43 BC delayed the question. The first disestablishments were enacted in the autumn of 40 BC, with the funerary park of Wudi's Empress Wei and the temple for Liu Zhu, the son of Wudu, he had been killed in the witch trials. The next month, secondary temples to Gaudi, Wendi, and Wudi, which had been built in various commanderies throughout the empire, were abandoned. The first emperor to have his main temple in Chang'an disestablished was Huidi, which happened in 39. Now I have to make an apology, because in the second episode on Wudi, I concluded by saying that the hand worshipped the four most recent emperors, abandoning the most distant ancestor once the new emperor came to the throne, with the exception of Gao Zhu, who was permanently worshipped, and then that later it was decided that Wu Di too would be permanently worshipped. In the interest of writing a satisfying ending to that episode, I failed to look into the matter further. The first mistake I made was to treat it as if the custom of abandoning temples had been in practice since the start of the dynasty, and thus I made it sound like granting Wu Di's cult permanent status meant reviving a temple that had been abandoned. But the custom of disbanding temples, at least as it was practiced in hand times, only began now, in Yuande's reign. The other mistake concerns which emperors were actually disbanded and which were worshipped permanently. Historian Mark Ed Lewis says that the four previous generations were worshipped temporarily, and Gaudi was worshipped permanently. Later, Wudi was also worshipped permanently. However, historians Homer H. Dubbs and Michael Lowe both say that Gaudi, Wendy, and Woody were all given permanent status from the beginning. Furthermore, Dobbs says that five, not four generations, received temporary worship. Because Lewis's wording about the permanent cults is a bit vague, I'm inclined to go with Dobbs and Lowe and say that Gaudi, Wendy, and Woody all had received permanent worship. However, because Lewis supports his statement that it was only the four previous generations that received temporary worship, with a quote from the Book of Han, I'll go with him on that question. The passage in question is a conversation between the Chancellor, Quang Hang, and Yuan Di, in which Quang said, quote, Setting up the four ancestral shrines marks your closeness to recent ancestors. As closeness fades, the shrines are eliminated in turn. The decline from near to far demonstrates that there is an ultimate end. On the topic, it looks like things get even more confused in the later hand period. Michael Lowe says that in later hand, only two emperors received permanent worship, Gaudi and Guangwu Di, the latter being the founder of Eastern Han. 
But Mark Edward Lewis musingly comments, quote, Western Han officials debated who should receive permanent remembrance in a cult, but in the Eastern Han, they debated only who should not receive it. I guess we'll nut that question out when we get to it. So anyway, a few other temples and funerary parks are abandoned, including those of Gaudi's father, and the mothers of Wendy and Zhao Di. However, in 34, this process was, re- was reversed. Yuan Di had become ill, and it was feared that this might be a consequence of having dissolved so many temples. The first to be resurrected was the temple of Gaudi's father, Gaudi's secondary temples, and the funerary park of Wudi's Empress Wei. There was also recorded the re-establishment of the funerary parks of Gaudi's mother, King Wu Ai, and Queen Zhao Ai. I believe these latter two were a brother and a sister of Gaudi. The abolishment of these parks is not recorded in the annals chapter of the Book of Han. The next year, the Temple of Hui Di and the parks of Wendy and Zhao Di's mothers were re-established so that all the funerary institutions which had been abandoned were now operating again. However, this reversal was not effective at abating Yuan Di's sickness. Shortly after he died in 33 BC, all the temples and parks which had been re-established were abolished again, and this time the Temple of Jingdi was also abandoned, for he was now five generations of emperors away from the present. The move towards less expensive funerary practices also manifested itself in Yuande's own tomb preparations. All previous Han emperors had forcibly migrated people to occupy their mausoleum towns in order to perform rites for them once they had died. On occasion, it had also been used as a tool to sever rich and powerful people from their local bases of power by placing them right under the thumb of Chang'an. But no such migrations were made to Yuande's tomb at Wei Ling. The edict from 40 BC announcing this decision expressed sympathy for those who were forced to move away from their homes. Quote, it is the nature of the many common people to be contented with their locality and to consider transportation to a different locality as a serious matter. To have one's flesh and blood attached and near to oneself is what human affections desire. A short time ago, some high officials memorialized that, according to the principles involved in the relationship of a subject to his ruler, Common people from commanderies and kingdoms should be transported to our tomb to uphold the sacrifices at our funerary park and tomb, thus causing people to leave and abandon the tombs and mounds of their deceased ancestors, ruining their patrimonies and losing their property, making relatives to be divided and separated from each other, people to be tormented by thoughts of longing and affection, and families to have feelings of dissatisfaction. Yuande's reign also saw some changes to the justice system. They were generally in the direction of making things less severe. In 47, an edict requested that, quote, if there is anything in the laws and ordinances that can be suppressed, abolished, reduced, or dispensed with for the benefit of all people, let it be memorialized in detail, and let nothing be kept hidden. In 44, another edict stated, quote, let the punishments be reduced in more than 70 matters, the vagueness of this statement is probably due to Bangu helpfully abbreviating the full edict for us. Later commentators specified that the reductions had to do with the application of the irrevocable death sentence. Another edict in 34 BC called for officials to conduct their trials more speedily and to leave trivial matters alone. It pitied those whose precious time was being wasted by being caught up in legal investigations. Quote, just now it is spring, the time when farmers and cultivators of silkworms begin their work, when the people unite their forces and use their energies to the utmost. Hence, in this month, we encourage the farmers and exhort the common people not to permit themselves to leave their work undone until after the proper time. But now evil officials, in reconsidering law cases involving small crimes, in calling and summoning witnesses in such cases, take up matters that are not pressing and so trouble the people. By making the people lose the one time when their work can be done, the officials cause them to bring to naught a whole year's labour. Let the ministers examine and investigate such cases, and inform and warn the officials about this matter. There was also an interesting desire, on the part of certain reformists, to deny convicted criminals the chance to commute their punishments through the payment of a fine or other means. Such commutations had always been a part of hand law, and had been especially prevalent in the reign of Wu Di, when the government had been looking for any method of increasing its revenue. Reformists objected to them though, believing that they compromised the impartiality of the justice system, favoured the rich, and decreased the deterrence value of punishments. 
In Swande's reign, around 61 BC, Xiao Wangji had successfully lobbied against a proposal that convicts could be exempted from further punishment if they served in a campaign to put down a Chiang rebellion that year. Under Yuwande, when Gong Yu became imperial counsellor, he presented a long memorial blaming the availability of commutations for a decline in public spiritedness. We are not told the outcome of his protests, but since no change is recorded in the annals chapter of the Book of Hand, I'd assume nothing significant came of it. In foreign policy, the reformist attitude manifested itself as retrenchment and even withdrawal. Policymakers were loath to push the boundaries of the empire any further than they already were, and instead decided which frontier areas should be maintained and bolstered, and which ones weren't worth the effort. In the western regions, a new office was created, based in the city-state of Turfan, known to the Chinese as Zhuxi. The office was called the Wuxi Colonel. The Wuxi Colonel acted as a sort of complement to the Protector General of the Western Regions, which had been established in Swande's reign as a local centre of authority for the various colonies. Like the Protector General, the Wuxi Colonel engaged in such activities as feeding colonies, building roads, managing relationships with the non-Chinese peoples in the region, and, when necessary, leading armed forces. Although in the western regions the Chinese tightened their grip on territory, which they already had their hands on, elsewhere Chinese possessions were simply abandoned. In 46 BC, after a rebellion by the local people on Hainan Island in the South China Sea, the Zhuai commandery there was disestablished. Previously, in Zhaodu's reign, the two commanderies which had been set up on the island in Wudi's reign had been merged. Now, in consideration of the rebellion, the expense of maintaining this largely pointless overseas outpost, and famines that were afflicting people elsewhere in China. It was decided that the resources required to maintain a presence there could be better used elsewhere. The government was very keen on cutting costs in the name of reducing the people's burden. However, when done in the military sphere, this economising could backfire. In the autumn of 42, there was a rebellion of the Chiang people, who lived in some of the western commanderies. Initially, a general named Feng Feng Shi, who was experienced with the Chiang, was sent to put down the revolt. Feng told the government he would need 40,000 men to do the job, but due to the government's aversion to large-scale campaigns, he was granted just 12,000. This anti-militarism ended up costing them more in the long run. As Feng had expected, his army wasn't large enough to complete the mission, and in the end, the government had to send another general with 60,000 men to help Feng out. Together, they fought the rebels over the winter and concluded the campaign in the spring of 41 BC. The most striking instance of Han reluctance to embark upon military campaigns came in 36 BC. The story of this particular incident intersects with the story of the Xiongnu, so let's quickly pick up where we left off from last episode. In Swande's reign, the Xiongnu Confederacy had dissolved into civil war, the various factions were whittled down to two groups, led by rival Shan Yus, the brothers Hu Han Ye and Zhu Zhi. Hu Han Ye had been defeated by Zhu Zhi, after which Hu Han Ye had led his followers south and submitted himself as a vassal of the Chinese emperor. Zhu Zhi had tried to come to some sort of favourable arrangement with the Chinese as well, to deprive Hu Han Ye of that advantage, and had even gone so far as to send his son to Chang'an as a political hostage. However, because he refused to go to Chang'an in person and pay tribute to the emperor, he failed to secure Chinese friendship. After this, he began to move west instead, and seek his fortune there. He eventually based himself around Lake Balkhash, in the modern-day Kazakhstan. This was north of the Tarim Basin, where most of the Chinese colonies and tribute states in the western regions were located, and separated from that region by the Tian Shan Mountains. In 45 BC, Zhu Zhi sent a messenger to Chang'an, asking that his son be returned to him. The Chinese didn't mind sending the boy back to his father, but dilly-dallied over whether they should escort him the whole way or just to the Chinese border. 
Eventually, it was decided that the envoy travelling with him, a man named Gu Ji, would go all the way to Meijiji. Though they departed in the winter of 44-3 BC, they did not arrive until 42. Zhiji, perhaps angry over this delay, executed Gu Ji. Fearing hand reprisal, he then decided to move further west. Zhiji received an invitation from the king of the Kangju to form an alliance. The Kangju were a nomadic people who lived in Transoxiana, an area that in previous centuries had been ruled by the Achaemenid Persians and the Seleucid Greeks. It was northwest of the Tarim Basin, closer than Lake Balkash, but still separated by mountains. Zhiji went there, leaving the main body of his people behind, and concluded the alliance by marriage. Using Kangju troops, he attacked the Wu Sun and other nomadic people who paid tribute to the Han. After more successes, he eventually managed some sort of usurpation of the king of the Kangju, killed the wife he had taken, and started using the Kangju forces to create his own state in the region. It's unclear what exactly the rest of his Xiongnu were doing. He exacted tribute from the Chinese vassal states in the area, such as Da Yuan, harassed Chinese envoys travelling in the western regions, and built himself a fortified city. One particular Chinese official in the western regions could see that this growing Xiongnu presence could become a major threat to Chinese interests. This was Chen Tang, a young man who was a subordinate of the Protector General of the Western Regions. He was from a poor family, and his ambition had inspired him to ask for a foreign posting, where he hoped to distinguish himself. He had gone to the Western Regions in 38 BC, about two years before these events happened. Cheng Tang wanted to nip this new threat in the bud. He brought the matter to the Protector General, Gan Yanshu. Gan agreed that they needed to do something about Zhizhi, and he was ready to send messengers to Chang'an so that he could get an imperial edict authorising a muster of the forces in the Western Regions. However, Chen was worried that a request for approval from Chang'an for a campaign against Zhizhi would cause delays and ultimately be denied. In the end, no messengers were sent. Gan Yan Shaw fell ill for some time, which provided Chen a chance to seize the initiative. He took the extraordinarily bold step of forging an imperial edict, whereby he ordered the mobilisation of forces in the western regions. He drew an army from the Chinese military colonies under the command of the Protector General and those of the recently established Wuxi Colonel, and also ordered a levy of soldiers from the local vassal city-states. They gathered at Wu Lei, one of the westernmost cities. In total, the army numbered 40,000. When Gan Yan Shu, recovering slightly from his sickness, realised what was going on, he was utterly shocked. He tried to stop the mobilisation, but Chen Tang confronted Gan and managed to convince and intimidate him into going along with it. They sent a message to Chang An, confessing what they had done, and then marched off before a reply could come back ordering them to desist. Using the strategy that had been developed in Wudi's reign, of separating the army into different routes, one half marched along a southern route, going through Da Yuan, while the other, led by Chen Tang and Gan Yan Shu, took a northern route, going through the lands of the Wu Sun. On the way, Gan Yan Shu's men encountered a party of enemy Kangju. The Kangju surrendered without much of a fight. They weren't very fond of Zhiji, considering how Zhiji had treated their king. They told Gan where to find Shiji's city. The Chinese soon found it and camped about a kilometre away. The city was surrounded by an earthen wall, which was itself surrounded by a double palisade, and then a moat. Inside the city, there were archery towers. Shiji sent out a sortie of his Xiongnu cavalry, who had accompanied him to the Kangju, to attack the Chinese. But the Chinese got themselves in formation and repelled Xiongnu with crossbow fire, which outranged the bows used by the nomads. Some of the crossbows used by the Chinese were so large and powerful that they could only be used by especially strong men while lying down. The cavalry retreated back into the fortifications. The Chinese surrounded the city. Then, with the front ranks carrying giant shields and the rear armed with crossbows and lances, they slowly advanced to the command of a drumbeat. With Chinese hydroengineering expertise that we've witnessed on a few occasions, they were able to drain the moat, and then, when they reached the palisade, they set a fire to it. The defenders retreated behind the earthen wall. Archers, including Zhiji himself, accompanied by dozens of women from his harem, 
shot at the Chinese from the towers. But the Chinese fired back and managed to kill some of the unfortunate concubines and hit Zhizhi on the nose, forcing him to retire from the tower. Night fell. Some Kangju cavalry arrived from elsewhere and half-heartedly attacked the Chinese lines. But like the party that had surrendered to Ganyan Shaw, they weren't really prepared to lay down their lives for Zhizhi, the man who had usurped their king and killed one of their princesses. They were easily repelled. Xiongnu from within the city tried to escape, but they were shot down by the Chinese. At dawn, the Chinese scared away the lingering Kangju relief force with fire, bells, drums and shouts. Then they broke through the wall, and Zhizhi and his doomed followers hustled into a makeshift palace where they spent their final hours. The Chinese set fire to the palace and looted the city. In the end, a thousand people surrendered, 145 warriors were captured, and 1,518 of the enemy were counted dead, including Zhizhi. By the way, in the account of this attack, it was noted that there were a few hundred soldiers with the Xiongnu, who fought in a formation that was, quote, like the scales of a fish. In the 1940s, translator of the Book of Han, Homer H. Dubbs, controversially speculated that these soldiers might have in fact been Romans, prisoners taken by the Parthians after the Battle of Carhi in 53 BC. He argued that the fish scale formation was the Romans' famous testudo formation, and that the double palisade that defended the city was a technique unique to the Romans. However, most historians have serious doubts about the idea, and it's not even mentioned in most of the modern works that I've read. That being said, it's not out of the question that soldiers from the area were using tactics that were learned from an encounter with European infantry in the past. As was the common practice, Chen Tang and Gan Yan Shaw reported their victory by sending the head of the defeated enemy, Zhi Zhi, to Chang'an. It was the greatest military achievement since the days of Wu Di. However, due to the illegality of the campaign, the news was greeted rather coolly by the important ministers. Yuan Di himself was apparently very excited by the victory, and the death of Zhi Zhi was celebrated with a general amnesty and an exhibition in the palace of maps and reports from the campaign. But the most influential men of government did not want to exploit the opportunity or reward Chen Tang and Gan Yan Shaw. Shi Xian bore a grudge against Gan Yan Shaw, and Quang Hang and Li Yan Shaw, respectively the Chancellor and Imperial Counselor, were both affronted by Chen Tang's forging an imperial edict, and were politically opposed campaigns of conquest. They warned that to reward Gan and Chen would encourage other officers in frontier areas to make similar attacks without permission. For three years after the campaign, Gan Yan Shaw and Chen Tang waited in a limbo to see if they would be punished or rewarded. Finally, in 33 BC, on the advice of Liu Xiang, that Confucian scholar from Xiao Wangji's clique, Yuan Di conferred a full marquise upon Gan Yan Shaw and made Chen Tang a Guan Nei marquise, the second highest of the ranks of honour after full marquise. The lukewarm reception of Gan Yan Shaw and Chen Tang, and the fact that the victory did not inspire a change in official foreign policy, showcases the Han's anti-expansionist outlook at that time. Yuandi's reign saw the rise of several consort families who featured in dynastic struggles till the end of Western Han, so let's give them a run through. Before Yuandi became emperor, his favourite concubine had died of illness. On her deathbed, she accused Yuandi's other consorts of using witchcraft to attack her. It seems he believed her, and from that time on, he became depressed and disinterested in the other women. Swandi's wife, Empress Wang, was put in charge of finding a new girl for the prince, Empress Wang brought a selection of young women before Yuan Di. Merely to appease his stepmother, Yuan Di said simply that one of them would do, without even specifying which one. It was assumed he meant the one sitting closest to him, and so she was duly sent to begin her life with him. This girl, in her 19th year, was Wang Zhengjun, the daughter of a minor official named Wang Jin. 
Although they shared a name with Swande's Empress Wang, they were not related. Despite Yuande's initial lack of enthusiasm, he grew to appreciate Wang Zhengjun. She bore him a son who was named Liu Ao. Swande, still on the throne, doted on Liu Ao and nicknamed him the heir apparent of the heir apparent. After Yuande became emperor, he named Wang Zhengjun his empress, and officially made Liu Ao his heir apparent. Liu Ao went on to succeed Yuande, becoming Emperor Cheng. Yuande also granted Wang Zhengjun's father a marquisate, and made her uncle an official. This was the extent of the Wang clan's rise during his reign. However, under later emperors, they became a very powerful and established family. Wang Zhengjun remained empress for the entirety of Yuande's reign. But there were other women who became favoured consorts and whose families consequentially became important political players. Chief among these were ladies Fu and Feng. It's not unknown when or how exactly Lady Fu became a consort of Yuan Di. All we know is that she joined his harem after he had taken in Wang Zhengjun, but before he became emperor. She bore him a son named Liu Kang, who was made king of Jiyang in 41 BC. Lady Fu was ambitious to have her son named emperor and eventually Yuan Di came to prefer Liu Kang and Lady Fu to Liu Ao and Empress Wang, and late in his life he even considered appointing Kang as his heir apparent instead of Ao. However, he was persuaded not to do so by Shi Dan, a son of Shi Gao, and a close friend of Yuan Di's, whom he had appointed as a guardian to Liu Ao. Shi argued that it could cause dangerous instability to depose Liu Ao, who had been heir apparent for more than 10 years, and was well known to the officials. Yuan Di also remembered the fondness Swan Di had held for Liu Ao, and retained him as his heir apparent. Although Lady Fu failed in her attempt to have her son, Liu Kong, become emperor, she eventually saw her grandson, Liu Xin, succeed Liu Ao and become Emperor Ai. When that happened, the Fu family took some very important positions, but we'll get to that when we get to it. The final consort of Yuan Di to mention is Lady Feng. She was the daughter of Feng Feng Shi, that general who put down the Qiang Rebellion in 41 BC. She became a concubine of Yuan Di after he ascended to the throne in 47 BC. She bore the youngest of Yuan Di's three sons, Liu Xing. An incident in 38 BC caused her to rise highly in Yuan Di's esteem. He and a number of his officials and concubines, including ladies Fu and Feng, were being entertained by a fight between wild animals when a bear escaped and came towards the crowd. All the spectators tried to run away, all except Lady Feng, who went towards the beast. The bear was killed by a guard before it did her any harm. When Yuan Di asked Lady Feng why she had approached it, she explained that she had heard that bears only attacked one person at a time, and that she was prepared to sacrifice herself to save him. As well as improving Yuan Di's opinion of her, it sparked a rivalry between Lady Feng and Lady Fu. Fu was embarrassed that she herself had not shown the same courage as Feng, and grew jealous of Yuan Di's increased affection for Feng. Unlike Lady Fu, it does not seem that Lady Feng was very ambitious to have her son, Liu Xing, named emperor. However, similarly to Lady Fu, Lady Feng lived to see one of her grandsons become emperor. Liu Xing's son, Liu Xin, became Emperor Ping, the penultimate emperor of Western Han. Yuan Di died on the day Ren Chen of the fifth month of the year Jingning, the 8th of July, 33 BC. The obituaries in his chapter and Chengdi's chapter are unique because they were written, at least in part, by Ban Biao, Ban Yu's father, rather than Ban Gu himself. Ban Biao's aunt was a concubine of Chengdi's, and as such, several of his relatives worked in the palace as attendants. They provided Ban Biao with first-hand accounts of Emperors Yuan and Cheng. The obituary is in keeping with the idea that Yuan Di was intellectually inclined, and not much of a government man. It talks about his various artistic talents, but admits that his leadership style fell a bit short of his father. It reads, quote, The elder and younger brothers of your servant, Ban Biao's maternal grandfather, were Emperor Yuan's palace attendants, and spoke to your servant, saying, Emperor Yuan had much ability in polite arts, and was good at the clerkly style of writing, at playing the guitar and lute, and at blowing the open flute. The clerkly writing was the standard general purpose script used in the Han Dynasty. Traditionally, it was said to have been invented from the small seal script attributed to Li Si, but archaeological evidence shows that it had been evolving since the Warring States era. It's very similar to modern Chinese characters. 
He himself composed the new songs, clothed them with melodies for singing, distinguished and indicated the cadences of the verses and music, and understood to the utmost the delicacies of poetry and music. When he was young, he liked the Confucians, and when he ascended to the throne, he summoned and gave officers to Confucian masters, entrusting the government to them. Gong Yu, Xie Guang De, Wei Xuan Cheng, and Quang Heng were successively his ruling chancellors. In fact, Gong Yu and Xue Guang De were just imperial councillors, though they probably would have become chancellors if they had lived longer. The emperor, however, tied and controlled himself by written principles, so that he hesitated to settle matters, and thus the achievements of Empress Xiao Xuan decayed. Yet he was broad-minded and had his inferiors express themselves completely. He was outstanding in his respectfulness and self-restraint. His proclamations and ordinances are polished and elegant, and have the spirit and fire of the ancients. On the point about summoning Confucians to office, let me ramble a little bit about some of the biases you encounter when reading about this stuff. I'm talking here off the top of my head, and mainly about how history is discussed in the popular sphere, rather than the academic. Many historical events from the last two centuries or so are passionately argued over because we can readily link them to current political debates. You'd expect that when it comes to ancient history though, emotions would run a little bit less high. The events happened so long ago that the way things turned out seem either to be of little consequence for us today or to be so fundamental that we can hardly imagine a different outcome. People might argue over whether the movement of Anglo-Saxons to Britain was a violent invasion or a peaceful migration, but for most, it's not going to be as emotionally charged as an argument over the nature of colonisation in Australia. But Confucianism, amorphous as it is, is kind of like an electric wire running through Chinese history. You've probably heard today about how in China there's a view that they've suffered a century of humiliation, how for most of human history it was arguably the most sophisticated and civilised part of the earth, but that in the 19th century it was cut up by Europeans and Japanese imperialists, and now it's going to take back its rightful place in the centre of the world. I'm not in a position to say how important or not this narrative is in modern China, but it's at least out there. And the thing is, Confucianism plays an important role in this narrative, but it's a different role depending on who's telling the story. For some, Confucianism is what made China so great in the first place, and maybe it can help China get back on its feet today. For others, Confucianism was a stifling intellectual weed that prevented China from competing with the technologically and organisationally superior Europeans when push came to shove. The role of Confucianism in Chinese history was hotly fought over after the fall of the empire in 1911, and it continues to be argued about today. Thus, when you read about the rise of Confucianism in the Han Dynasty, even though it happened so long ago, and even in more scholarly works, you can sometimes detect little hints of passion. For some, the rise of Confucianism is a step along the road to the apex of imperial China's glory. For others, it's the beginning of an end that happened about 2,000 years later. I'm talking vaguely here so that I can't be accused of making claims about any particular individual's beliefs regarding these topics. I'm doing a little pussyfooting. Don't treat what I've said here as an authoritative statement on historiography. It's the subjective experience of an amateur with incomplete knowledge. So that's it for Yuan Di. And this will be the last episode for a while. I can't make any promises about when the next one will come out. Um, yep. But uh, I do intend to finish this series though. Um, if you've been enjoying it, you can send feedback to offspin-history at tutinoda.com or use the message box on my website, offspinhistory.wordpress.com. And um, as always, I'm not a historian, and I'm not an academic, I speak Chinese. And I'd like to thank Professor Shui Shan Yu from Northeastern University 
for letting me use his music from the album Gucci Music, the Vibrant Rhythm of Ancient Heroes.